So far we have been able to solve mostly every shot that we have been tracking, um, but there are certain kind of shots that are impossible to solve. And this is one of these shots. So you just have um, a panning motion, so that means that there is no parallax, no perspective shift, but just a panning from left to right, up and down, without really a movement. And that is something that is very hard or impossible to solve. In some other applications you have a so-called tripod mode or nodal pan mode, where you can tell the software that you didn't have any movement, but the camera has just been panning. And in that case, there might be a way to solve that. Uh, in Blender we don't have a tripod mode yet. But even if there would be a tripod mode, then there are a certain kind of shots where even that would not help. And that is for example the case here, where the camera has not been really standing on a tripod, so that the movement really was from a nodal point, but where you have a kind of a mix between a very slight movement, but also just panning around from left to right. And that is something that is really hard to track. And I want to show you how impossible that is by just tracking the first 200 frames, because in the end there are some frames that might help with this movement. But first I want to just track from frame 1 to frame 223 or 24. So back in Blender, let's go to the movie clip editor, then click on open, then go to the folder with your footage to camera tracking, and then to the pan folder, and then open up this shot. This shot is not full HD, this is just 720p, so 1280 to 720. Um, so first let's set the end frame to 223. So that should be rather easy to track. Maybe the solution will be harder, but tracking that should be very easy. So I will just place some markers here and track them and then come back. In the meantime, I have tracked this shot and in theory that should be good enough. So we have a lot of markers. We have some markers here in the foreground, some markers in the background. Everything is more or less covered. So that should be all right. There's a little problem here with that marker that I should fix. So Alt T to fix that, that's okay. So that should be really enough to give us a decent solution. So first, of course, we have to set it to the right camera. And again, in this case, it has been the 550D. And I guess that the focal length was something like 20 millimeters. I'm not sure, but something around that. Then we can collapse that. Also the keyframes, like maybe set it to, I don't know, 44, or maybe let's make it 30 and 80, or 20 and 80, I don't know. So 20 and 80, so there should be enough uh, perspective, at least it looks like that. So let's see what happens if we solve that, Shift S, Ah, uh, we are below one, so it seems to be okay. Maybe we can trigger the refinement too. Shift S, and indeed it is refining the solution. We are at 0 0.4, so that also looks correct. So let's split the view, go to camera, of course set up tracking scene, that is the floor. But somehow that looks uh, kind of weird. So that is definitely not what we are seeing here. So all these markers should be on one plane, but it's not. So if you look through that, then this is definitely not the floor. And these should be like rectangular to the floor, but apparently they are not. So that is totally incorrect. And that is simply because we don't have any decent perspective information in this shot. But also it's not really a nodal pen where you would say like, maybe I can demonstrate that, 
So in theory, a tripod shot or a nodal pan would look like that. So you have the camera and just rotate around the z-axis, for example, or just rotate like that. So that would be a tripod shot and that is possible to solve with uh, the right solver that we currently don't have in Blender. So basically the camera would just rotate but would not move at all. But this camera is, if you enable the camera path, here in the sidebar you can go to motion tracking and then enable show camera path. So we do in fact have a motion and it's kind of jittery. So if you look at that, that doesn't look right at all. So that doesn't work. So if you want to shoot something like that, where you just pan around without really moving, then you can do something to help the solution in the end, and that is to just shoot some additional frames where you move the camera. And that is what I've done here. So if I extend this from frame 223 to next frame, next frame, then maybe I go full screen here. Then you can see that so I have to extend that here. Um, that I have some extra frames where I've been moving around and by using these frames we can provide Blender the perspective that the solver needs to calculate the movement and the perspective. So um, the way I did it was to, um, to have my normal shot. This is getting a little bit annoying. Uh, so let me first, first put the end frame here. So E for end frame. All right. So the way I did it was to just have my normal shot. And after that, with the same camera, with the same focal length, that is very important. So with the exact same settings, I went and moved and took some single pictures. And after that, I combined them with this shot. And you can do that with a Blender sequencer, for example. Or if you don't want to take single pictures, you can also just uh, first take your shot. And when you're finished, you just start moving from left to right. Doesn't have to be long, just a few frames. So that you have some very distinct perspective shift. So here, in that case, because this is rather far away, I really went and moved a few meters so that here we have some significant parallax. And well, the important thing is that you combine that and especially that the camera is the same, that the lens settings is the same, so the same focal length, everything should be exactly the same. And then you can very easily combine that and now, of course, we have to somehow also combine the tracked features. So with that, we can now go ahead and pick the single features and track them. So we need a few more frames here until we reach the single frames. So here we can now, of course, not just uh, move it and have it automatically track. In this case now we have to really manually place that. So that is one of the reasons why picking the markers yourself and not relying on the detect features is very helpful because when you now exactly know where this feature is, then you can just take it and now manually move it to this point. So here and the next frame is also offset but because it is not so far away, I think we might be even uh, able to just increase the search area quite a bit. And now Alt right arrow and that eventually finds something that is at least near that feature. In that case, it's not. So we have to manually place it here. Alt and in this case, Alt right arrow has been able to find this spot here within the search area. So even though, yeah, it's the end frame. So even though it is really far away, we have been able to automatically track that. But of course, that is not always possible. Okay, so next feature, we've got that. And now Alt, right arrow, and then make the search area really big. Eventually that might help in this case, 
No, we have to again place that manually. Alt, right arrow, again manually place that. And here we can just disable that because the feature is not visible anymore. And if you press L, then you can check if everything is right. So you can see that this is very tedious, of course, but there's no other way to do it. And in the end, you will have a decent solution for that. So it is a bit of work, but it is totally worth it. So let me just finish that. And after that, come back with the tracked markers. So here we now have all of the markers and I try to really get every of these markers that we have in this panning shot and then connect it with the frames that I've added manually. So that feature, for example, now goes there and then that is, of course, a lot of work. So this is really tedious, but with some good music, then you can just uh, do that. And I think it's uh, 10 minutes or so, then you're finished. Okay, so with all these markers now tracked, let's also have a look at the curves. So A to select everything, then let's have a look here. So these are the frames during the panning shot. You can see here we have got new frames where they are entering the visible area of the shot. So that is of course here, where is it? Here. And then in the end, we've got quite a bit of motion. But this is not an error. This is just the way the movement is. So we have a lot of movement, so a lot of acceleration. And if you look here, then you can see these are not really spikes. They're just markers that are uniformly moving very, very fast. So that's why you get this. We also just select this one and then Alt T, because that works since a few days, which is awesome. So yeah, um, now, it's time to solve that. And to do that, of course, first, maybe let me hit Alt S to hide the search areas. Um, so first, of course, we have to adjust the keyframes because currently these are still set to 20 and 80. And on the keyframes 20 and 80, you don't really have any movement. You only have this panning. So let's set the keyframes to these two frames. So that is 226 and 227. So go here, 226, 227. And without adjusting these values, I just hit Shift S, because you remember these have been the values that we have uh, calculated during the panning shot. And they cannot be right, because I know that my lens cannot go to 16. This is rather something around 20 millimeters or so. So Shift S. and we are at 0 0.6. That's quite promising. Also, the focal length now matches way better than before. And if we have a look at the 3D view, then we can already see that this makes quite a bit of sense. So let's first go ahead and set a floor. For example, with this, um, this, and this. So select these three markers, then go here, set floor. And also we can set this as the origin and this as the x-axis. Let's have a look from above. Yes, and I think that's fine. And if you look from the front view, then indeed most of the markers are on the floor as they should be. Then we've got these here along the z-axis, which is also great and exactly what it should look like. So these are these three markers. So that's fine. And if you now hit zero to look through the camera, then it works really well. Um, you've got a few markers here that are not quite on the floor, but these have been the tracks that have been in the very near foreground. And I think they have not even been visible during our perspective frames. So that are these three markers. And it's not a big problem if these are not 100% correct. So as long as the general camera movement is okay, you can live with that, I guess. Next, let's also enable proxy timecode so that here in the 3D view, we see the effect of the undistortion. And I would say that works pretty nicely. So let me bring this up. 
one blender unit. Also make this go more in the foreground. Then I guess we can adjust the rotation of the camera a little bit. So let me select the camera and rotate around the 3D cursor, which is currently here at the origin of the scene. If it's not, then you can also set it here, 3D cursor, set everything to zero or hit Shift C. So now with that, we can go here, set 3D cursor as pivoting point, zoom out, and then R, Z to rotate around the origin so that this line now really lines up. And yeah, it works. And it works best for the things that you add here, because if you add something there in the foreground, that is not really tracked. Because if you go back and forth, then you can see that here there's almost nothing in the foreground. So if I now bring this cube in the foreground, like so, then this will be not as stable as something that is here in the background. So if I zoom in here, then maybe you can see that there is in fact, a little bit of jittering. So that is not ideal to put something in the foreground, but if this cube is more in the background, like here where you have all these markers, then this cube will be much more stable because that's where you have your stable markers. But well, you can see that with this technique of adding additional frames, or like helper frames, you can really save a shot that would otherwise be impossible to solve. Let's have a look at the camera path. So here, if I zoom in, then you can see the very, very tiny movement of the camera. So it is in fact a little bit jittery and also, even if we would smooth the jittering, then we still would have a little bit of movement. So it's not really a nodal pen. There is in fact some movement. So here you can see how I have been holding the camera in my hand and moving it around. So it definitely has not been a really a tripod shot or a nodal pen. It was a free pen. And free pens, when you hold the camera in your hands, is always something that is very hard to solve unless you have some helper frames. And even if you are not panning or rotating or doing a tripod shot, then it can still be helpful to provide a little bit more perspective. So if you shoot something, maybe I can just move the camera manually or maybe use another one. So if you shoot something, then you can just do your normal camera movement. If you are uh, holding the camera in your hands or if you are doing a steady cam shot, then if it's possible and if you are on set and if you are the one who is shooting, then it's of course easy to do that for you. Um, so then you can just uh, film and do your camera movement. And when you are finished with filming, maybe if it is possible for you, just keep on filming and walk around the set keep on walking and give a little bit more perspective. That can help you to uh, really nail down the camera movement that you want to have in your shot. So if your shot just consists of a very gentle movement or even panning or something like this, then it can help to just before or after that, just give it a little bit more perspective and movement.